Since we're speaking about symbiosis, what I'd like to do is to speak about ecosystems, about business ecosystems, about creating and capturing value in business ecosystems. Now, of course, that's what I'd want to say, because I'm a business school professor. And at this time of the afternoon, you might want some light affair. So let me back up a little bit. And let me speak about wine. And let me give you a blank check and say that you can go and buy some great wine, and you're looking at a wine shop. You want to get some good red, and you're going to the wines of Bordeaux. And you can think about the great names of the French wines, names like Chateau Petrus or Chateau Margaux, that have legendary reputations and also steep prices. Now, then, you'd like to also take something for a dessert wine. So you're thinking about some good vintage port, this great sweet wine that's made in Portugal. And you're looking around, trying to see what are the good port wines that you can get. The names are Sandemans, Dows, Warres, Taylor and Floodgate, which is kind of strange. Because on the one hand, French names for good French wines. But if you think about the Portuguese wines, they all have British names. And the question is, why? Why is it that the names of the Portuguese wines are British, and it is the British houses that are able to make money on the wines that are being sold? Well, I'll tell you why. It has to do with the fact that these guys are shippers. The French guys are growers. They are the ones that have the grapes and turn them into wine. You can go and you see the chateaus, whereas the Portuguese ones are shippers. And the question is why? Well, let's do a bit of history and figure out why things are so different in the very same product, why you have two people in different parts of the value-adding process guaranteeing and also making all of the money. And it all starts with this chap, Napoleon Bonaparte, known, among other things, for his height. Now, Napoleon, together with many of his French countrymen, had one trait, and that is a rather visceral dislike for the French. And he actually went to war against the French. And one of the annoying things when you go to war against a country is that the wine supplies start drying up. So the poor Brits that absolutely loved Bordeaux wines found themselves without wine supplies. The problem was solved through Portugal, and the people who sold that were the people that were shipping the wine from Portugal back to London. What these guys did is to go to the final customer and say, oh, don't worry, I am going to tell you which wine is good and which wine is less good. And as I certify what wine you will want to drink or not, as I am the one that gives you the name, I'm going to be the one that's going to be keeping the returns. 1815, the Napoleonic Wars are over. Good Bordeaux can flow again from France into the UK. The shippers say, this is terrific. Because we know what we're going to do. We're going to take over the trade of wine. We also will say that Trust us. We'll tell you what are the right wines to drink or not. Now, the French, of course, understand that that would be very bad news. They get the idea that if they lose the ability of differentiate to the eyes of the customer, they're going to start losing where the money is. And they're saying, no, 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 it's not about that. It's actually about the terroir. It's about the area where it is actually made. And for about three decades, an advertising war, the first advertising war in the history of humanity, goes on in the trade newspapers of the United Kingdom, where shippers, pub owners, growers, all are trying to convince the fr that in terms of the French wine, it is they that should be able to guarantee it. Now, it's interesting because the guy who managed to close the deal is the nephew of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, who rather annoyingly is called Napoleon the Small. Now, when you're the nephew of a rather small guy to begin with, I guess that that doesn't look too good, which is why you're going to see up in the slide that he's got these huge paintings of him. 
be that as it may. Napoleon the Small said, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a classification des grands crus classés. We're going to say there's a lower growth, and then there's a premier cru classé, and this way we will create a rigid system to convince anyone who consumes wine that the only thing that matters is where it comes from. And they made it so rigid that they didn't change it. Actually, they changed it twice, once because they literally had forgotten the wine, and these people said, hello, we're on the map, we waited on the original list, please put us in. And the second time, it was from one of the wines of the Rothschild family. And I guess you don't really want to piss off the Rothschilds who bankrolled you in various different ways. Now, what that shows you is that who is able to guarantee quality, who makes a difference in the eyes of the consumer, is not given. It's something that varies. In port, it is the shippers. In Bordeaux, it is the growers. In Côte du Rhône, it's neither the shippers nor the growers. It is the commerçants. It is the people that go and buy the grapes and uh, create these great wines. And if you think about what's going on today, you have, especially in the middle and in the lower part of the market, the big retailers. Sainsbury's coming up with its Blanc de Blanc Champagne, or Tesco because they too want to make sure that they are the ones that you actually turn to in order to identify what is valuable and what is not. And if you contrast that with what you'll need when you've drank way too much coffee, uh, wine, which is coffee, uh, and if you think about coffee, coffee is quite similar. And it's actually one of the most widely traded commodities on the planet, just after uh, oil. Now, coffee grows in wonderful, lush places like uh, the highlands of Ethiopia. And the people that grow coffee, the people that are up in the fields in Ethiopia, do a terrific job caring about their crop, caring about the way that the crop is put together, much as the French counterparts that are growing wine do. But if you look at what's happening in Ethiopia, unfortunately, they need food aid to be able to live. And the reason is that for every one euro or dollar or pound of coffee that you buy at Starbucks, they get one cent of the value add. And for all the effort of activists like Tadame that you'll see in the picture and others, whether it is fair trade or other organizations that are trying to rebalance who captures value in the value chain, the lack of the Grand Cru of Ethiopia, the different organization of the sector has a lot to do with who is able to make money and who not. Now, if the question of who in a complicated business ecosystem is making money is interesting in sectors as old and slow moving as coffee and wine, it gets much more exciting when you think about most of the sectors today. Why? Well, because from telecommunications to healthcare to energy, what we see is that the sectors are changing. Firms disintegrate, they outsource, they break up, they create new ways of adding and capturing value. Let me give you one example and think about these devices that we are all hooked up. Think about things like the iPhone. Now, the iPhone does amazing things. It allows you to find a dinner date from someone that you had never met before. It allows you to interact with angry birds. It allows you to figure out what the weather is and know where your friends are and following them through town. Now, this is something that no one product used to do. And what our economy consists of today is more and more sectors that create new products. But not only new products, but also new ecosystems. New ways in which actors are put together to create value. Let's go back to the example of an iPhone. Because the iPhone is not a device which is fully made and done fully operationally, only from the virtues um, of Apple. It, it, it relies on an ecosystem. It requires the telecommunication, which is provided by the likes um, of Vodafone. It requires the product to be done. Apple doesn't create any of its pro products. If you look at it its back, you'll see designed in California, manufactured in China. It's companies like Foxconn that do that. 
You have apps that you go and buy from its store, but the apps that you buy from its store are not done by Apple. Apple takes 30% of the apps that it has there, but on the other hand, it makes none. It leverages the energies of others. So what it does is first create something that makes the customer really, really happy. It's not just about differentiation. It's not just about being better. It's about differentiability. It's finding where the customer is going to give the money, like in wines. In wines, it's not important whether you are a better grower or whether you're a better shipper. It matters whether growing or shipping has the value. It's not just about the differentiation, but the differentiability. So the first thing it does is that it makes sure that it adds a lot of value to the eyes of every one of us. The second thing that it does is that it manages very carefully its supply base. Apple would never go and buy anything unless it has at least two sources from which it can actually take it. Usually, much more than that. Why? Well, because if you have an alliance with many friends, and if you are the only one in there, then the value comes to you. So the second principle that explains to us where value exists in an ecosystem is the principle of relative replaceability. Big, fat academic words. And there was an academic that actually cared about the relative replaceability that drives value quite a lot. This bearded political uh, economist that used to live a bit further up uh, north from where my office in London is, by the name of Karl Marx. You see, Marx was rather annoyed that these dandies of the capitalist era were having a nice life, enjoying looking, smashing, and not working really that much, and having a grand life, whereas the workers were literally breaking their backs with 80 nowadays. And that was bothering him. He was trying to understand why, in this very simple ecosystem, with capital and labor, all the money was going to capital and none was going to labor. And he eventually said, ah, I got it. I know why this is happening. This is happening because there is the reserve army of the unemployed. Because if there's so many people who are willing to enter the labor force, and if there is such intense competition in the labor force, then the price of the labor will go down, and then it is the capital that will be the scarce commodity. It is the capital that will be the bottleneck. It is the capital that will be the one that will be able to attract the most amount of value, because you cannot replace it. Now, as a business school professor, I like looking not only at cases, but at data, and you'll indulge me uh, sharing some of that from the research that we have done. And what we've done is say, well, OK, let's think about ecosystems. And let's be a bit more serious about it. And let's take the value, and here I'll show you a graph of the total market cap in a couple of important sectors. And first, you'll see the computers. So what will I show you? I will take the entire ecosystem of the computing sector, and I'll tell you how it shifted from the 1980s to 2005. Who do I have here? The big integrated computer makers, the likes of IBM uh, and Dell, the guys that make computers. This is what you see up there as computer manufacturers. I also have the people that make software over there, the people like Microsoft um, or uh, other big software providers like WordPerfect that some of us uh, might uh, remember. You also have semiconductors and related devices, the guys like Intel or AMD. And what we're looking is how they are splitting the market cap of the sector. And what you can see from 1980 until 2005 is this dramatic change in who makes money in the computing ecosystem. This change that made the 13 out of the 50 richest people in the universe. And what you're seeing here is precisely what I talked to you about. First, the differentiability shifts from making the computer to the operating system that you use, as well as to the central processing unit. Second, through standardization, firms like Microsoft are able to shift the value by making themselves more central, more valuable, and opening up the floodgates of competition in the other parts of the sector where they don't compete. 
Let's contrast this with another sector. And I'll tell you a little bit about cars. Because cars is kind of interesting, and cars changed quite a bit over the last two decades. You may or may not know that the car manufacturers only manufacture around 25% of the value add of what is in your car. All the rest is outsourced to all kinds of suppliers. And the interesting picture here is the picture of how value went along, or didn't, as the case may be, with this huge outsourcing. So here's the interesting thing. The car manufacturers kept all the value, and none of the suppliers that were doing more and more stuff was able to take it back. Now, why? Two reasons. The first reason is that they were able to keep differentiability. They are the ones driving the experience. They are the ones telling you why one car is different from another. They haven't even let Apple go in the car. They want to manage the electronics of the car and not make it be a vessel of all the different value-adding components. The second and perhaps unexpected thing is that they also take legal liability for what they build. What do they do? Well, they say that if something goes wrong with the car, and if we need to recall, I'm not going to say, oh, sorry, that was my tire supplier that did a bad tire. Winchell, I know nothing. That was this other supplier that did it. Don't look at me, Gov. They are legally liable every time things go wrong. They go and they do the callbacks like the ones that we just saw from Toyota uh, coming up. And they need to stand behind it. And paradoxically, this thing that seems like a huge nuisance, as something that they wouldn't want to do, well, these things are what allowed them in the long term to rule the sector. Now, if you think about it, you'll understand also what happened in the case of Tesco. As you all know, we recently found out that some of the burgers in Tesco contain meat. Now, Tesco doesn't manufacture the burgers. Not even the suppliers of Tesco manufacture the burgers. Not even the supplier suppliers actually do the burgers. They buy uh, their meat from all kinds of complicated networks. Tesco didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, that, I, I don't know anything about these things. Ask, ask my supplier or ask my supply supplier. They actually went and took the responsibility and said, we cocked up, we need to repair that, and it is our responsibility. And the reason that they did that is that they knew that if they hadn't done that, then they would have lost the possibility of keeping the trust of the consumer, and they would have lost the possibility of ruling the supply chain. Short-term uh, pain for long-term gain. The last thing that I'd like to tell you has to do with value creation versus value capture. I spoke about Apple just a moment ago. And I told you that Apple manages replaceability very intelligently. But make no mistakes, the first thing they do is to do something that will make you deliriously happy, that will make you love their products, that will make you groupies. And because they made you groupies, they are able to rule their own ecosystem. Differentiability first, replaceability second. The size of the pie first, the share of the pie second. That's the way to add value. Now, unfortunately, we know that there's other ways in which we can make value. And the other ways has to do with focusing on the share of the pie. And here in Greece, what's happening is that most of the focus is creating replaceability, not because you're better, but because you're the friend of the government. Who you make a replaceable doesn't have to do with value at all. You do it the cheap way. You do it by excluding others from competing. Whether you are a garbage collector, whether you are a taxi driver, whether you are a notary public, what you tell to society is, don't let other people compete because I would like to keep the value in society. Don't let them create new ways of adding and capturing value because I would like to continue making a good life. The problem, though, is that what we have found out is that this mentality of adding and capturing value, I would say capturing value and not caring about the rest of society just doesn't work. And we know that once we break these barriers, once we put value creation first, once we stop thinking about the division of the pie and we allow new configurations, great things can happen with society. The good thing is that technology and competition 
means that we're going to have the possibility of seeing these new products, seeing these new offerings. The big question that we have is whether we will be able to be part of that or whether we're going to be watching things walk by. And I think that we should take our leaf from most of the companies that we know as the drivers of value today. Think about Google. Google is also very strategic in the way that it manages its supply chain. But before it goes to strategize its ecosystem, it asks the people that are involved in its project to answer whether it passes the toothbrush test, whether it's something that relates to you that you do every day, that is part of your routine, and that can make a difference to your life. And after that, they are able to structure the rest of the ecosystem. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to think first about the creation of value and then about how we're going to be dividing it. So next time you sip some wine, drink your coffee, drive your car, open your computer, search on the internet and look at your smartphone, think about what are the true drivers of value and the principles by which you can capture value. And after you've done that, turn back to yourselves and remind yourselves that you too are part of an ecosystem. Your firm is an ecosystem. And think about how some of the same principles apply to you. Ask yourself, can I learn something from Tesco or Toyota's acceptance of the short-term pain in order to gain long-term gain and become less replaceable? Can I find a way of cementing my position by becoming more differentiable rather than by trying to keep people away? And as you think about not only you and your careers, but all the other ecosystems we're embedded in, whether that is your sports team, your scout troop, or anything else that makes you happy, think about the creation of value first and think about how we can make a better world. That's what PLUS means. Thank you.